Now imagine someone whom you can chat with, help you to write essays, stylish poems, uh, computer programs, or even generate business plans from scratch. Now, not exactly someone, is it? Yeah, that's right. You're talking about artificial intelligence and the bots that can do just that. And there's one called ChatGPT. It was released last month, and the tool has captivated the Internet. So far, more than a million users have given it a go. The chatbot is the latest development in the world of artificial intelligence, which has attracted billions of dollars in funding from tech investors. ChatGPT can serve up information in tight sentences rather than long lists of links. The chatbot can also retrieve and repackage information with a speed that humans could never replicate. That's right. They can be thought of as a digital assistants like Apple's Siri or Amazon's Alexa, but better at understanding what you are looking for and giving it to you. It was built not just to string words together, but to have a conversation, remembering what was said earlier and explaining and elaborating on its answers. Here's the catch. ChatGPT doesn't exactly know anything. It's an AI that is trained to recognize patterns in vast swathes of text harvested from the Internet to deliver more useful, better dialogue. Experts believe such a chatbot is poised to reinvent or even replace Internet search engines like Google and Bing. But there are also skeptics. What do you think, Steve? Awe or afraid? Would you consider yourself a skeptic? Well, I think you'll have to be skeptic until you sort of know more information. And I certainly want to know more, as it still sounds a little sort of complicated to yeah, me. It certainly is. So let's see it in action to better get a better sense of how it works. OK, so let's uh, try this. Uh, write me an essay on artificial intelligence. We'll put that in. Yeah. <laughs> and that was quick. It didn't take very long. And the quality of the answer, not bad. I'm impressed. Yeah, that's easily 400 words that we can see just sort of popping up on the screen. Mm. I'm definitely not seeing any grammatical uh, or spelling errors as we sort of uh, look through the text as it's sort of flying across the screen. <laughs> certainly working a lot quicker than I could uh, uh, manually. Yeah, talk about a shortcut, right? I'm not saying I would copy this word from word, but uh, if I were in school, yeah, definitely make our lives a, a lot easier. And yeah, more challenging, perhaps, for professors and teachers to mark grades as well, mm. not knowing whether the student actually did the work or ChatGPT did it for them. Uh, let's uh, try something else then and uh, type it in and see uh, what happens uh, with it. Sure. Christmas just around the corner. So let's try, uh, does Santa really exist? <laughs> okay. How's that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, one that perhaps some parents might delicately uh, want to answer for their children. Mm. Now, the question I like this and the answers that you can know, as you can see, sort of coming down on the screen right now. Wow. OK, so I have to say, I like how it's giving us a little bit of context and a background right there. Yeah, it looks like it uh, doesn't really have a yes or no for us, though. It's just sort of uh, churning out a lot of text. <laughs> I guess so something should just uh, stay a mystery. Mm. Yes, perhaps. Now, for more on the implications of the process, of the progress in the process that made it chat GPT and AI. Uh, we're joined by Toby Walsh, a laureate fellow and Scientia Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. Uh, thanks uh, for uh, joining us uh, today, Professor. Uh, let's just quickly get your thoughts on uh, chat GPT and the company behind it, uh, OpenAI. It's a very impressive demonstration. And I think it's one of those moments where you get a little glimpse of of part of what the future is going to look like. It has some very impressive abilities. It certainly can write business letters. It can, it's even written a, a film script, uh, answers ex exam questions. There's lots of things it can do. But as you hinted at in the intro, um, it also doesn't really understand completely what it's talking about. Most of the time it gets it right, but it, equally it can be very persuasive, but completely wrong and just make stuff up. Um, at the end of the day, it's not really understanding like you and I understand what it's saying. It's just saying things that are probable. Mm. So tell us about its potential uh, impact and uh, new possibilities that the technology could have on uh, society and people's daily lives. Who or which sort of industries would benefit the most? Well, if I was a top executive a company like Google, I'd start to be a bit nervous. Um, Google, of course, is working on tools like this. Um, but this um, young startup, OpenAI, um, has certainly stolen the attention uh, in the immediate term. 
Um, and if you think about it, you know, before Google, um, we I, I think remember thinking uh, Auto Vista, which was the search engine of choice, would be all that I ever needed. And Google came along and had a better way for me to access information. Um, and since then, I've never looked back and used that as my search engine of choice. And uh, this ultimately, rather than have to uh, follow links and look things up yourself, if the search engine can actually answer the questions for you, and we can deal with this fundamental issue of it making stuff up, um, then I suspect that's going to be my favorite destination, not Google anymore. I do have a question about how it sort of makes things up and the dangers of that, given the level of misinformation we have in the world right now. But I just want to quickly ask you about the ethics of it. You've written a book called Machines Behaving Badly, The Morality of AI. What do we need to be thinking about in terms of the ethics of artificial intelligence as it creeps into our lives and workplaces? Yeah, well, I mean, the good news is not what Hollywood have you, have you believe. It's not that the robots are going to be malevolent and decide to take over the planet. It tends to be much more subtle, insidious things. Actually, it's that we give responsibility to machines that aren't capable enough. Um, and it's typically the unexpected consequences that, you know, well, what are the consequences of this? Is this going to transform how we teach people? Are, are we going to have to stop people setting exam questions where we ask people to write essays because they can just ask chat? GPT to write them the essay themselves. So how do we actually then teach people to write properly if we can't actually ask them exam questions anymore? Mm. Uh, for a chat GTP in particular, Professor, what are the potential abuses of uh, such tech, you know, we weaknesses or flaws that worry you the most? And how can we prepare to defend against the, the flaws and shortcomings of this technology? Well, I'm really pleased you've asked that question because that is one of the great concerns. This is the perfect tool for malevolent people who want to make up stuff. And we've we've already seen social media is full of fake news and phishing attacks where, where people try and persuade us to click on links. Well, here we've got a tool that at speed and scale and at very limited cost uh, can produce very plausible text that is much more likely that we will click on it than the emails that we're used to to get from, you know, Nigerian scammers now we can actually personalize those emails to to you know any information that we can glean from you about up from the web um so it is in the wrong hands a potentially quite dangerous tool but the question then is whose hands is it in what do we know about open ai how this works the transparency of how a chat gpt even sort of exists and, and does its work Yes, this is developed by a company called OpenAI. It's um, a very well-funded startup company. Um, one of the founders was uh, Elon Musk, who never seems to be out of the news these days, uh, and Peter Thiel. Um, and their idea is really to solve artificial intelligence, and they want to do it ostensibly in a, in a, a non-malevolent way. They actually want to do it for the benefit of humanity. Um, and as the name of the company suggests, OpenAI, they were they initially started out doing it in a way that was going to be open and accessible to all. But um, since they started up, the company's changed from being a not-for-profit to being a uh, a profit uh, company, um, and uh, the openness seems to have disappeared. Uh, everywhere but except in their name we we don't know so much about exactly how this technology works we don't know for example we we believe that um the million people they're using it now are actually helping to improve it but we're not ex exactly sure um how people's queries are being used to improve the output and get rid of some of those troublesome ways it makes stuff up and Professor, before we let you go, looking further into the future, this might sound like a scenario from a movie, but are, are there any concerns about the potential for AI acquiring so much power, so much control in the role it plays in our lives that it could potentially take over or replace humans in some roles or jobs, for example? But I'm, I'm not too worried about the machines taking over. They don't have any sentience, any consciousness, any desires of their own. They only do what we do. I'm actually perhaps more worried that we're going to become a bit too lazy and, and let all the tools um, do the stuff for us. And we, we might actually become stupider because we're not writing essays anymore. We're getting chat GPT to write the essays for us. So um, uh, there are certainly things to be worried about. And, you know, and I've written a whole book. Um, about the many things that we need to worry about. But equally, we face some really wicked problems today. And AI is going to help us deal with the climate emergency, increasing inequality, uh, and many of the other challenges. And hopefully, um, we can sit back and enjoy the cocktails.
<laughs> Sounds like a great plan. Before we get there, though, just one last question for you. Advances in the tech space often move faster than the rules and regulations to govern them and safeguard the interests of ordinary people. Do you see that happening with AI? And what are the implications? Yeah, that, that is a very good point. Um, regulation does tend to lag technology um, by, by many years. We're, we're just starting to see social media being adequately uh, regulated today. And we, we increasingly, every, every time you open the newspaper, there's news stories about um, lawsuits being taken by European Union and elsewhere against the big tech companies. Um, and so, yes, I think we do have to worry about whether um, these these new latest developments also will lead to harms, whether they, they be in social media or elsewhere. And um, we do have to move for, forwards quicker and faster with the regulation because um, we are discovering that these are just like any other business um, and they become data, they become data monopolies. Um, and we do need to regulate those markets to ensure that all of us profit from the benefits that these technologies are going to bring. All right, Professor, we'll leave it there. But thank you very much for this fascinating discussion on uh, ChatGPT and AI. Toby Walsh, their laureate, a fellow and science professor of artificial intelligence at the University of New South Wales, Sydney.